to talk about donuts and entrepreneurship. So I'm just going to start off by recognizing what Ingrid was recognizing that we're we're living in a time of repeated crises. This is how the 21st century has begun with financial meltdown in 2008, with climate breakdown and ecological breakdown as the, the, the structure of our times, and now in COVID lockdown. And these repeated crises tell us that we are deeply interconnected with each other and with the rest of the living world. And these very crises are emerging from the systems that we've created. And I believe that they are systems of endless expansionism, whether it's endless financial expansion, endless uh, industrial expansion, or uh, endless travel and expansion into wild places. All of these three crises I'm showing are boomerang effects back from humanity's expansionism of activity. And we need to transform the ways in which we work and the goals that we are pursuing. So as a rejoinder to these crises, I offer the donuts, this, this concept where we aim to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. Uh, so the goal is to leave nobody in the hole of the donut falling short on the essentials of life. And those come from the sustainable development goals. So I crowdsourced those 12 social foundations from the SDGs. The power of that is that it means that all the governments in the world have already agreed that all the people in the world have a claim to these essentials. That's, that's already agreed. So leave no one in the hole, but don't also overshoot that ecological ceiling because there we break down the life supporting systems of planet Earth. And these come from the nine planetary boundaries recognized only just a decade ago as the critical life supporting systems that make this the only known habitable planet in the universe. So we'd be pretty crazy to bust through this ceiling. But as we know, that's exactly what we are currently doing. So this is the state of humanity and the living world. All of the red in the middle shows you the extent to which people are falling short on the essentials of life. The red wedge on food, for example, goes 11% of the way to the middle of the circle because 11% of people worldwide don't have enough food to eat every day. You can see on every social dimension, people are falling short on water, for example. Uh, one person in nine doesn't have access to clean water sources and one in three doesn't have access to what we would call a toilet. But people in countries rich and poor, mostly poor, are falling short on the essentials of life. And yet we're already overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. Indeed, I can bring this home in headlines. So climate change is hitting harder and sooner than forecast. That means we need to act faster and harder than we thought we did. There are plastics in human bodies and animal bodies across the world. Since 1970, that's the year I was born, so I'm 50. So anyone who's in that same age bracket as me, in our little lifespans, the number of other animals living on this planet has fallen by almost 70%, while the human population has doubled. Children and all of us are breathing toxic air. There's land degradation, water shortages, phosphorus pollution, ocean acidification, and the world's wealth, half of it is in the hands of just the richest 1%, which is maybe the hardest statistic to actually get your head around. So if you want some good news on the Tuesday morning, I love this headline from NASA, hole in Earth's ozone layer is finally closing up because humans did something about it. And we can, of course, do something about all of this because it's all driven by our behavior. It all arises from the systems that we've created. But in the words of the American writer, William S. Burroughs, after taking one look at this planet, any visitor from out of space would say, I want to see the manager. And we would have to ask ourselves, which manager would we take this alien visitor to meet? Many people turn first to national governments as if they were the managers. And here are three national donuts. So at the one end, you've got Bangladesh, a lot of red in the center showing that that nation is very much falling short on meeting the needs of its people. People live in great human deprivation, but not at all overshooting any planetary boundaries. At the other end, you've got the United States almost meeting the needs of its people. And it really should be doing that with no problem at all because it's one of the world's richest nations but it's massively overshooting planetary boundaries. And let's just be clear that overshoot isn't overshoot of resource use within the land that is called the United States. It's embedded in all the consumption that comes into the United States. And then in the middle, we have China, which like many countries is both falling short and in overshoot. Let's bring it a little closer to home, Europe. 
likewise, just like the US on a slightly lower per capita income, but massively an overshoot in planetary boundaries. And let's bring it home again a step more for you. So the Netherlands is one of a few countries that is covering off all of the social foundation. Now, let's just put it into context. This is a very low global bar. This is a, a sustainable development goal bar. So actually all high income countries should have that central circle completely blue. But the Netherlands, like all high income countries, is massively overshooting its impact on planetary boundaries and needs to pull back within those boundaries due to resource use at home, but also to the resources embedded in all the imports that are consumed within the Netherlands and the stream of waste that flows out. So that's the national story. Now, if I put it into the context of 150 nations, these are the national donuts of 150 nations. Size is population and their position is whether they are meeting the needs of all. So you want to go up the, 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 the y-axis, but do so within the means of the planet. So that donut in the top left-hand corner, that's the sweet spot where you're meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. And you can see there are no countries close. We've got the classic countries that people describe as developing nations, I think we're all developing nations now, so I don't use that language, but these are the low income nations predominantly that need to meet the needs of their people for the first time, but without overshooting in the way that every country before them ever did. Then there's the high income nations, your country, my country, all high income countries, closer than most to meeting the needs of their people, but we know there is, there is real deprivation within the heart of our very wealthy countries, but massively overshooting planetary boundaries. So need to make an unprecedented journey tracking back across to the left-hand corner to getting back within planetary boundaries. That's never been done before. No government has ever aimed to do that before. This is a new 21st century vision, a new 21st century path of development we need to make. And then the countries that people are often calling emerging economies have the double whammy of needing to meet the needs of their people for the first time and already come back within planetary boundaries. How do we do that? Well, let's go to another level of the managers that we would take our alien visits to meet. And to me, it is, oh, sorry, before I go there, we need to recognize the, the profound interdependence of these nations so that the high income countries haven't achieved their high income and their high well-being in, independently of all other nations. It's come through a history of impact between nations, of colonialism, of structural adjustment imposed on low income countries. The, the, the international arrangements of debt and of trade rules, which were st are structured to the advantage of today's high income countries, the resource extraction practiced by their industries, and of course the climate change impacts that are driven by high income countries predominantly are falling first and hardest on the low income. So there are extreme inequalities of power embedded in these different clusters of nations. So how do we rectify this if we are to bring ourselves into the donut, all of humanity? Every country here on this chart needs to take an unprecedented journey. And that means that last century's economic theories, last century's business models, last century's governmental policies are not the guide to getting there because they weren't designed to solve for this. They were designed for growth and, and that pursued uh, material satisfaction, but it has pushed us over planetary boundaries. So we need to come up with new models that actually solve for this challenge that's our generational challenge. And that's why I want to bring it down to the level of business. And I've sat around the donut with hundreds of companies over the last eight years, from three person social enterprise startups to Fortune 500 companies. And it's just been really fascinating hearing the very different responses that companies have. And over the years, I've come to consider in a very simple way to ask myself whether companies are the kind that need to transform to do the donut. And the, the, the images I've got here are of brands of companies that I would say uh, need to and are trying to transform to do the donut. So DSM is a good example, establishes Dutch state mines. And over the years, they've totally transforming their purpose. And now they say, oh, a DSM stands for doing something meaningful. But they are a company that really significantly needs to transform the heart of their design if they can say we are doing business that brings humanity into the donut. All of these companies, in a fascinating way are attempting to say, instead of making profits by pushing humanity out of this space, we actually want to be able to say, we as an enterprise and our core operations are bringing humanity into the space of the donor. Can they transform? To me, that's a really crucial question. But then there are also companies, and I want to focus on these ones today, that are born to do the donut. 
the enterprises I've got here on the right hand side, if I show them the donut, they can literally say, but this, is, this could be a, a, a symbol of why we exist. We exist to get carbon out of the energy system. We exist to end slavery. We exist to provide health and well-being. That's our purpose. Now, all of these companies here at one point were started by entrepreneurs. But the companies on the left hand side have become so big today, we don't think of them as entrepreneurship. They, they've become large established companies. And I want to focus on what is it that enables the entrepreneurship on the right hand side of those companies that are born to do the donut. But I invite you to think of entrepreneurs as well who, who are setting up enterprises that don't bring humanity into the donut, but just setting up enterprises because they can see an opportunity in the market. They would also need to transform to do it. And so you can carry them along in your head as I talk these ideas through. So, how do different companies respond, whether they're born or transformed to do the donut? How do they respond when you put the donut in front of them? And I call this the, the enterprise to-do list. What's an enterprise going to do when it's confronted by the donut? Well, the first response is the oldest, which is to do nothing. And this was predominant in the late 1970s, Milton Friedman, who famously told us that the business of business is business, and that's its social responsibility. And so, well, the donut and the state of human affairs is a, is a very sorry thing, but you know, everything we're doing is nearly legal and we'll just keep on going until the cost of the fines we face exceed the profits we make from doing it. There's no place for this kind of business in the 21st century. So we need to move up one level to the very common approach, which is we'll do what pays now. So if we will save money in our supply chain by cutting our carbon emissions, and you probably will, then we'll cut our carbon emissions and we get cost savings. If we will get niche consumer access through getting some kind of green certification, then we'll go for the green certification. So this is moving in the right direction of social and environmental values, but it's far too incremental, far too slow to get us in the direction that we need to go in this time we have. The next step up is to do your fair share. And I'd say this was pretty dominant in the last decade. We heard many companies, particularly in terms of climate change saying, well, our national government's committed to cut our carbon emissions by 25% in the next 25 years. So we'll cut our carbon emissions. We'll do our fair share. And the trouble with fair shareism is that it never quite adds up. So anyone who's been to a restaurant with friends and everyone's chipping in what they think is their fair share of the bill, it often doesn't quite add up to what you need to hand to the waiter at the end of the night. So we're gonna go up another level which is to do mission zero. And indeed, the science is now telling companies, science-based targets are saying, if you want to do your fair share, it turns out that your fair share of carbon emissions is zero. The ambition has risen. So to do your fair share means to aim for net zero. By when? <clears throat> is it by 2030, 2040, 2050 is too late? So bring it earlier. And mission zero is a transformative approach to doing business because business has never been done like this before. To also have zero polluted waste water leaving the factory, to have zero injuries in uh, the workforce and in the supply chain, to have zero child labor and zero labor exploitation in supply chain. This is transformative business. But as the regenerative designer Bill McDonough would say, mission zero tells us to be 100% less bad, to do zero harm. And he'd say, why aim for zero when we can actually break through that ceiling of our imagination and aim to do good, to be net positive, to be generative? And this I call doing the donut because that's what the donut invites us to do. We need to transform the dynamics in order to bring ourselves back within the donut rather than just stop where we are outside of it. So what would it look like to do business in the donut? And I think we need to create regenerative and distributive dynamics in the very design and cooperations of businesses if they are to say they are part of bringing humanity into this space. What do I mean? Well, this is the degenerative linear economy that we've inherited. Classic, take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while and throw it away. And this is what pushes us over planetary boundaries and runs down the ecosystems in our own neighborhoods. This is what it looks like when we take again and again and again from Earth sources. And this is what it looks like when we throw our waste again and again and again into Earth's sinks, plastics into lakes and rivers and electronic waste into the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people. And I sincerely believe that our grandchildren, yours and mine, our grandchildren will pull photographs like these from the archives and will tap us on the shoulder and say, did you know about this? 
did, did, did you ever see this? Because they'll see so clearly what it is. It's an extraordinary disrespect for the living world and for our fellow human beings. And they'll see the obvious that instead of this linear degenerative industrial system that we practice as if it were normal, we need to create a regenerative or circular cyclical system where resources are never used up, they're used again and again. And this is what would enable us to work with and within the cycles of the living world, separating biological nutrients on the one hand, capturing value as they decompose and restoring them and placing them back into Earth's living systems, because the right hand, the left hand loop here, sorry, the left hand loop is nature. This is what nature does. She regenerates, she recycles and reuses and breaks life down and back into building blocks and restores them. But the right hand loop of technical nutrients any human made materials like this alarm clock made of plastic, it needs to be possible to restore it and repair it and reuse it and refurbish it rather than chuck it away because one little piece of it broke. So this is an economy that runs on renewable energy in which waste from one process becomes food for the next, the core tenet of the circular economy. It's of course going to need modular design so things can be taken apart and refurbished and repaired. And, and see a move from ownership to service, from buying light bulbs to lighting, from buying a car to buying mobility, from buying a washing machine to buying laundry. Some examples, and I'm gonna draw from those companies that I say are born to do the donut. So on the biological side, Sanergy toilets, the slums of Kenya around Nairobi, those are one of the places where there were no toilets that I mentioned earlier. Well, now there are, thanks to Sanergy, which was actually an enterprise founded by three graduates from MIT after a visit to Kenya. And they saw that the, the lack of toilets in Kenya was completely undermining the health, the prosperity, the dignity, and the possibilities of that community. So they set up Sanergy toilets, which are micro enterprises distributed throughout the community. The waste is collected every day and it's then turned back into fertilizer and applied to the fields. So at the technical level, they are closing the loop on nutrients, on phosphorus and, for, and nitrogen nutrients. But at the human level, they are creating dignity. They are creating health, community and enterprise throughout this neighborhood. And then again, still on the organic side, Houdini is a Swedish sportswear company and all of the clothing they make, they aim to make it 100% uh, circular. So they always separate the organic fibers and the technical fibers. So organic, they use wool and tensile. And those, the clothing will only be made of wool and tensile. They won't mix in with it nylons because you can't separate them again. So these woolen clothes, um, they say once they're, they're worn out, bring them back to us. And they literally compost them in Stockholm. They turn them back into compost. And then to prove the circularity of this, they then grew vegetables on that compost and served the food as a meal to some of their clients and then some of their customers and said, you are eating your old ski wear to show this circularity and return of nutrients to the soil. On the technical side, companies that are designing products to be modular and open, I've chosen a, a company from your home, hometown, Fairphone, who unlike all other mobile phones are making phones intentionally openable, click open by design and the videos on YouTube telling you how to click it open. So it doesn't even have to go to professional repair, it can be repaired by the customer themselves so that it can be part of an endless loop of reuse. And then again, I've drawn circle, the building in uh, the ABN AMRO building in Amsterdam because it's an amazing building to visit. It's both biological materials, it's made of wood, which holds carbon. So it's sequestering carbon in the very fibers of the building. But it's also, as you may know, uh, a click open building. If you look around, everything is bolted and screwed together so that it can be unbolted and unscrewed. Nothing is glued, cemented in. So all of the materials that are in that building could be then used again and again in a future life. So these are some examples of putting regenerative design into the very design of a company's products. But that's just the one half of the story. What about distributive design? And I think 20th century enterprise was celebrated for focusing on the principle of capturing as much value as possible for those who own the enterprise. In many countries, this came to be seen as law or a deep culture of business, the shareholder fiduciary principle. And this is what business is. And this is what the CEOs of successful 20th century companies would write their biographies about. This is how it works. This is why 
of the world's rich own half of the world's wealth because enterprise has been set to capture so much of that value. But 21st century enterprise and the generative kind asks a very different question. It focuses on sharing value far more equitably with all who co-create it. Indeed, there are many companies that are set up exactly to do that. That is their purpose. And again, let me give a few examples from those who are born to do the donut. So rooted ownership. Good Energy is a 100% renewable energy company in the UK. And to launch, they, they, were unable to get, um, they were unable to get a loan from the bank. They went to a bank to, to see if they could get a loan to start up. And the bank said, oh, we don't think solar will work in the UK, sorry. And so they ap appealed to their customers and their future customers. And they are 60% now owned by their own customers because they were the first crowdfunded energy company. So the ownership of the company is held in the very hands of the people who are buying the energy. So rooted ownership and the value that's created goes back into that community. Fair chain relations. So this is a farmer picking coffee in Ethiopia. And we all know the story of commodities like coffee that a tiny fraction of the value of that commodity is held in the hands of the farmer. And the vast majority of it, the commodity is exported, it's roasted in Europe or the US. And then the real value of an of expensive, exclusive cup of coffee is captured in the high, at the other end of the supply chain in the high income countries. So Moye Coffee, again, another Dutch company, set up with the aim of ensuring that far more of the value of the coffee is retained in the country of origin. And so they set up their roasteries in Ethiopia and in the countries they're buying from precisely to ensure that that nation and its people were benefiting from this very high-end product that they were creating. Open source innovation, back to Houdini sportswear. Houdini are innovating fabrics and innovating new ways to be as sustainable and regenerative as possible. And then they said, we don't want to see other companies producing cheap rip-offs of our best clothing. So they said, we're going to do open source innovation. Here you are, here's all the information you need to know how to make one of our signature products. Here is the fabric, here are the textiles, here's who we make it, here's how we sew it, here's how we put it together. Because they say we want to be part of an ecosystem. We don't want to be the only company that's doing this. We want the whole world of textile and fabrics to be like this. So we have to share our innovations with the ecosystem. So distributive of their intellectual property, the opposite of so many companies founded on the basis of proprietary control over um, intellectual property. And then lastly, the fair tax commitment. So a company like Lush, uh, which sells uh, all sorts of smelly and fun soaps and shampoos, they have signed up to the fair tax mark. What does that mean? It means they've committed to paying the right amount of tax in the right place at the right time. Now they've become, going from a small entrepreneurship to a very big international company, they recognize that many companies like themselves spend an awful lot of money and time ensuring that they pay the least amount of tax in the fewest number of places as little as possible. And so they've committed to the opposite because they know that private benefit of running a company depends upon healthy public finances and sector as well. There is a symbiosis between the public and the private. So these are just four examples of ways companies design in distributive design. I could also talk about employee ownership, living wages, supply chain, ethical. So there's so, so many different ways. So I always ask enterprises, where are you? Where do you think you are on the business to-do list? And I would invite all of us to think about this with every company that we are find ourselves working with, every enterprise that you're supporting, and indeed for all students to look at their own entrepreneurship relations, whether it's another company or a company they're setting up. Where do you aim to be on this to-do list? Often you'll find that somebody will say, well, the founder speaks as if we're doing the donut, but actually the product manager is really just incentive to, incentivized to do what pays now. Or, well, when it comes to climate change, we're doing mission zero, but when it comes to labor rights, uh, that's not really on our agenda because we're about sustainability, but not inclusivity. So we're only doing one, not the other. So many companies would find themselves split across these different levels. So you're never in just one place. There's always a, a rich nuance within the enterprise. Can we do business in the donut? Is it even possible? And why is it that some companies would profoundly need to transform where others seem to be doing it by, by design. And to me, the most interesting thing to explore in enterprise and entrepreneurship is not the design of the product. It's not what kind of plastic is this made of and what were the wages paid to the people who assembled it. That's all important. But what really matters and what really determines that is the design of the enterprise itself. 
And for me, every time we at Donut Economics Action Lab engage with a company, we always go very quickly to the design of the enterprise. So here I'm drawing on the work of Marjorie Kelly, who is a brilliant uh, analyst of corporate design, and she calls herself a next generation enterprise analyst. Let's just say very simply, again, using this 20th and 21st century design, that the 20th century business model was one of extractive enterprise, which was dominated by one overarching question that's asked throughout business, which is how much financial value can we extract from the way we design this enterprise? And again, you, you feel this question in the board meetings or in the newspaper articles or in the biographies of the CEOs that this question was driving and the, and the success on this question is what was so often celebrated, especially by the stock markets. But generative enterprises that are doing the donut, that are aiming to do the donut, I think ask a very different question. And whenever I talk to their founding entrepreneurs, whether I talk to their employees, you can hear this question singing out from everything they say about what they're doing, which is how many benefits can we generate in the way we design this enterprise? Benefits for the community, benefits for our customers, benefits for the living world. What can we give back to the living world on which we depend? Of course, benefits for our owners or our shareholders, but those in balance with so many other benefits that we want to generate. And what is it? that leaves some companies in that extractive mode while others are already dancing in this space of generative design. For me, it's these five design traits, and I think they should be at the heart of every student and every analysis of enterprise. So the first design trait is purpose. What is your purpose? What are you in service of? Why do you even exist? And Apple say they exist to have the best uh, experience user experience for their customers in terms of their innovation their software fine but fairphone their purpose why they exist is to build a deep understanding between people and their products driving conversations about what fair really means that's why fairphone exists as you may well know it began as a campaign to find out whether it was possible to produce mobile phones without labor exploitation in supply chains so they have a totally different purpose. But Tony's Chocoloni, Tony's exists to have a world with 100% slave-free chocolate. Not just Tony's chocolate, but all chocolate. Their purpose is so much bigger than themselves. Sanaji toilets in Kenya, there exist for a healthy and prosperous Kenya. So enterprises that have this generative purpose, the purpose is so much bigger than themselves. They've seen a, a, a challenge in the world that needs solving. And they've said, we are gonna set up an enterprise as a vehicle for transforming that issue. We're not here just to do business, we're using business to make change in the world. What about networks? I'm gonna turn here to Good Energy, that UK um, energy company. They've built very, very strong networks between their customers, between their energy suppliers, and between the industrial ecosystem of which they are a part, such as companies that install recharging electricity car points around the nation. And by having these strong networks, these different uh, relationships they have, of course, all hold them to their purpose, which is to transform the energy system in the UK. So that when push comes to shove, that their networks of which they are a part will hold them to that and that they influence those networks as well. So they influence the ecosystem of electric, um, electric transport, for example, through their relationships and through their own standards. In terms of governance, well, we all know companies need to think about the principles and their practices, their metrics of success and the incentives that they give to their own staff, the culture and the norms of how they do business. And extractive enterprise, of course, counters this with the, the, the saying that the quarter is king, the quarterly report is king, and that so many people, if you talk to a chief financial officer or indeed a, a middle manager in so many large companies, They'll say every quarter we have to show we have growing sales, growing market share and growing profits. And where is the room for becoming generative, for becoming sustainable and inclusive? We don't have room in that tight uh, control over our finances and our returns to pivot our own internal design. So, of course, there are inventions of how to create more space in companies to free them from this quarterly report tyranny. One is to become a B Corporation, to write into your articles of association. We are here not only for financial return, but also for social and environmental return. It's a really interesting question. To what extent being a B Corporation can free a company from that pull of extractive finance? 
Likewise, the economy for the common good have created a, an economy for the common good balance sheet that companies can then take an assessment and see their own relationship in that balance sheet where they need to improve. And there are some regions and towns, particularly in Germany and Spain, where the, the local town council or the district are saying we are giving a tax deduction to companies that have a, a good score on the economy for the common good balance sheet. So it's becoming a tool of recognition and reward for companies. And then I just want to bring in on culture and norms, Triodos Bank, the CEO of Triodos Bank, told me that every Monday morning, we spend the first 45 minutes as a team in our head office, talking about our purpose, looking at a case study, because when we spend that first 45 minutes, it puts that purpose at the top of the signboard, it puts purpose right in the heart of our vision and it steers us through the week. So that's about creating that culture of governance that's in line with purpose. So purpose networks governance, these are the easy design traits to get right. Let's go deeper because the most powerful design traits lie deepest, ownership and how a company is owned, whether it's owned by venture capital or shareholders or private equity or by employees or by indeed its customers through crowdfunding or owned by a family. Now, all of these ownership designs, I'd say, could possibly switch sides, that they don't necessarily sit on either of those sides. But what matters about the ownership of how that company is owned is going to profoundly shape the bottom design trait here, which has to be, of course, finance. And what finance is demanding and expecting, whether that finance demands short and financial and high returns, and I will sell and get out if you don't deliver them quarter on quarter on quarter, or whether that finance says I'm here for long and holistic returns like you, I'm invested in you because I want to bring about the transformations that you're bringing about in the world with a fair financial return. And what FAIR is, is a, as, as Fairphone have shown, FAIR is a very big open question as to what is a fair financial return. So how do we enable ownership and finance to be part of that generative future? So with any enterprise that we at Donut Economic Action Lab sit down with, we always go quickly to this signboard and say, what are the design traits that are pulling your enterprise back into extractive design. There's going to be some, which ones are they? Which ones can you change? What could you do about it now? And where are you stuck? Is there something about your ownership and finance probably because that's a very deep design trait that is making it very hard for you to pivot. But what are the design traits that already would enable your enterprise to become generative? And how can you bring those forward? What can you do to turn the arrows on your signboard in the generative direction? And I would love all students at the, um, the HVA in the Faculty of Business and Economics and indeed in space of entrepreneurship to always have this signboard in their mind, whether they are setting up an enterprise, whether they are joining one, whether they are analyzing one, whether we are researching it, to look at it through these design traits, because this is, enables us to be a detective about what an enterprise can be and do in the world and where it's going to get stopped. And even if they speak, a wonderful regenerative purpose of inclusivity and sustainability, if there's something in the design that means it's going to be incompatible to, to highlight that and to bring it out. So how do we transform the design traits of enterprise to enable enterprises to be generative, to be regenerative and distributive and bring humanity into the donut? And what are the regulatory and infrastructural and cultural changes that are needed in the wide ecosystem beyond the limits of the company itself, but that wider ecosystem in business and in finance, crucially, what are they that are required to enable generative enterprise to become the 21st century norm? So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna invite us just to recap. Imagine an enterprise, an entrepreneur sitting in front of the donut. Can you create an enterprise that actually helps bring humanity into the donut rather than drives us out? Where on this, enterprise to-do list, would you place your enterprise and what are you actually aiming to do? How can your enterprise be regenerative and be distributive by design if we're gonna to aim to do the donut? And where does it sit on this design signboard? And what would it take to turn the arrows all the way to being generative by design? Now, when I finish, what I'd like us to do first, before we jump into questions, I would love us to go into breakout groups and dive into exploring some of these questions. So. You will, we'll give you in the chat box a link to some Google slides that you can then go into your breakout group and work on. And these will be the questions. Start with companies that 
were born to do the donut. First of all, name some enterprises that you know of that you think that you would say these were born to do the donut. They are, are mission based enterprises. And then ask yourself, what are the key challenges that they face? those companies that are born to do the donut. It is not easy, we know that. What are the key challenges that they currently face? And what research agendas and engagement can best support their ability to succeed? If we want to put entrepreneurship research and engagement in service of generative design, then for those companies born to do the donut, what kind of research would that be? How would we be enabling their success? And then there's a second slide for both each group. If you want, look at companies that would need to transform to do the donut. Now you can see that all the logos I've put here are of large companies that were entrepreneurs a long time ago and have become major corporations. You could look at some of those or you could look at enterprises and small entrepreneurship setups that were not designed to do the donut would need to transform if they want to be part of it. Again, name some enterprises that you would say need to transform if they want to do the donut. What are the key challenges facing those businesses that would need to transform to do the donut? What's so hard about it for them? And again, what research agenda and engagement would best support their ability to succeed in doing that?